of hours to do, and it's been very helpful. I've read most of the documents, if not all of them. Basically to say, uh, colleagues, I'd like to suggest, oh, first, uh, apologies, and uh, so on. Can we have uh, from you in Kuleko, what's there? In Kuleko? Aye, aye, Chaperson, come again. Apologies? Oh, no, Chaperson, I did not get any apology other than uh, Mr. Dudoid, um, who has a clashing meeting who might uh, have to leave very soon. Yeah, quarter past five is what he told me, we understand. There's no voting today. It'll hopefully happen on Thursday if all goes well today. So basically, what I suggest, unless somebody else has got a better approach, is that we first uh, get the retail uh, Clothing Retail Federation to give us an overview of their presentation to us, their letter and so on. And then we get a response from Treasury and they can go through their documents. And then we ask Frank Jenkins to give the legal opinion and then we have, uh, because Esther doesn't like speaking, I will go through some key points in a document and you will uh, add to that. Hopefully we've all read it. We've had plenty of time. We've had two week constituency break. But I don't see anybody overtly here who's from the Federation. Yes, Jefferson. They are not they here. Oh, right. So we'll have to go through the document. Wow. Okay, I have read it. Uh, and, and I take it others have read it, but uh, uh, are there any questions people want to ask about their document? Uh, basically, they, they, nobody else has got his any hand up, no. All right, in that case, what's going on here is they're basically saying if you look at them, uh, at their letter of 27 September, 4-1 uh, on Botswana, uh, they, they're basically saying the same thing as they've said. The more important point they say is, look at paragraph two, it should be also noted that the closed loop credit facilities, such as those offered by themselves, are not covered by the Non-Bank Financial Institutions Act and hence would not be caught in the net as credit providers in terms of Botswana financial intelligence legislation. So presumably the team from FIC and Treasury will respond to that. Early, they point out that uh, when Botswana was faced with a great listing, the FIC Act was amended by adding the following category of accountable institution, namely a legal entity registered or incorporated under any law. Then uh, 5.1, oh, this is sort of a risk based approach. They say basically it boils down to a rules based approach and that the uh, supervisory authorities are not following a risk-based approach. Costs in general, they don't give, unfortunately, any documentation. So it's hard to work out whether they write or the uh, FIC and Treasury are, but they will comment. On the risk assessment, uh, they note that these, they note that the exclusions are not based on risks and, um, they suggest that FATA, this is something you have to respond to Treasury FIC, appears to be open to potential exclusions, provided they're justified. Yet Treasury appears to be adamant. Yeah, well, can you, I know you've applied to that before and you have now, but can you make it very clear that what you're saying is exactly what FATA requires? And then they, they say that the minister has sought to allow the NCA in this regard. Treasury, FIC have vehemently argued against an exclusion of close shop retail store credit facilities. Then going beyond the NCA, obviously that's the argument. And then, uh, yeah. Talk about blind submission to an international standard without taking actual risks into account. Ultimately, it's a trade-off, but, and one can negotiate maybe. I don't know how the FAT works. Others of you here from the Treasury will tell. But it's clear that um, as far as possible, we have no choice. And if it means unintended consequences in one sector, as much as we can avoid it, so that the country as a whole can avoid the gray listing. I mean, which politician is not going to agree that we go for what we think the FAT at once? Okay, so that's it. Uh, does anybody know why they didn't turn up? Because they, 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 they Welcome to Albania. Is it that they've just given up? Do you know why they're not here? 
Uh, they did not respond to the emails that I sent, Chairperson. Which emails told them there's a meeting today and so on? Yes, Chairperson. All right, there's nothing we can do, colleagues. Okay, over to Treasury. By the way, uh, is there anybody else who's got a better approach than what I've suggested? Because I'm cool. I, I don't know how you go about it. What I've suggested for those of you who just joined us is let's hear the Retail Federation first. But unfortunately, not here. So I went through the key points that I had read. And then let's look at what Treasury's replies are. Then let's have Esther, uh, the lawyer's document, that's Frank, and then Esther, the team's document, and then throw it open for discussion. Instead of having endless discussions on tits and tax and so on, let's look at it holistically and then decide where we're going and whether we can take policy decisions today. So having said that, Treasury and FIC, can you respond to this letter and respond as a whole? You sent us I, chair, I yeah. see there's a hand from Advocate Jenkins. Yeah, Frank? Chairperson, uh, good afternoon, uh, committee. Thank yeah. you. Thank you just for um, hearing me. I have an engagement. I need to fetch my kids from school at 10 No, to no, no. Five. Fine. You go now. You go now. Go now. Then. But I'm not yeah. 10 to 5, Chair, and then I'm back quarter past 5, just for a quick, quick moment. But I'm, I'm here. So I just wanted to know if I shouldn't do my bit first before National Fine, Treasury. I'm saying you can go ahead. Same time, go ahead. Okay. Instead of giving a long, just to be understand. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, so, Chair, I was, uh, and thank you for, for Treasury for not opposing that. Thank you. Um, Chair, I was asked, I think the most interesting question that, that was there was um, the, the NCRF's contention that the unintended consequences should go to a court um, and, and for the court to rule then on that. I, I have my doubts whether that can happen, Chair, unless those unintended consequences materialize. And the reasons I put out there um, I've looked at certain um, academic articles and so forth, as well as court cases. And, and the main issue is really that the court, when it, it sees with a matter, it looks at its um, jurisdiction, its scope, and of course, it's very wide, it's all constitutional matters, but there must be an arguable point of law, and I'm referring to section 170, uh, 167 of the Constitution. So... There must be an arguable point of law. So somebody will have to say that these consequences and, and then argue that it is against the law, um, like they have um, various um, rights in the Bill of Rights that are there. But but it, it, it must be an, an, a, not an academic point. That, that's the, the main issue there. So if there is somebody, and, and we've seen it, and that's not very difficult to find a claimant uh, in these matters to someone who is then who felt that they're wronged in this matter. Uh, and Chair, of course, one can say that the, the, the action might not succeed, but nevertheless, anybody has a right to at least approach the court. But, but that little part in the in section um, 167 will, will have to be complied with by whoever brings an action. Um, and one can't just say that we can't deal with, we can't implement the amendments because there's unintended consequences. If we don't know those unintended consequences, the court is not going to be seized with the matter. We will have to see how it is, how it affects someone's rights, that you have the right to argue in terms of that and that there must be an issue, a legal issue the court can resolve. So, Chair, that was, in short, the first part. Um, the second part is, can we excise or can we then move or remove those parts which are offensive to the NCRF? And I've, I've basically cut and paste from a previous note I wrote to the committee on this for, for both the standing and select committees a little bit earlier this year when we were just seized with these um, amendments on the three schedules. Uh, according, the three schedules firstly are made in terms of an act of parliament. So they constitute um, subordinate legislation. And in terms of that, one always looks at the empowering provision in the act. And the act, and I reference it there, section 73, 75, and 76, says that these amendments don't become operative until they're approved by the houses. But you can only approve them. You cannot approve them in part, and one cannot approve them um, or, or make amendments to them. So it's either approve or reject. Uh, so if, if the committee agrees that certain areas need to be excised, there's two options. Either National Treasury must bring new amendments or we must reject all of them, but we can't approve them in part, in my reading of, of the empowering provisions in the legislation. Um, yeah, Chair, the, the issue again in question three, for me, it, it's very much aligned to question one. Uh, it's speaking about the N NCRF's concerns that FATF has not conducted a risk assessment impact study. 
uh, there's a knee-jerk reaction and we don't know what will happen. We, we do not know how, how burdensome this might be on, on various people affected by the legislation. Again, uh, if one can prove that there's an arguable point of law, if one can then have the standing before the court, then it's uh, an issue of the impact that we see and the rights that have been affected. If the impact is um, disproportionate to the rights that are being affected, if the rights are more important, the court will find in favor and, and strike these down. But it is at the moment a, a speculation because we do not know, we, we can't define unintended consequences because it's unintended or we, we don't know what, what exactly it is. We'll know that business might become more expensive, might become bottlenecks, but unless we have the right that's been affected, show the impact and have, then the court can do the analysis, but at this point in time, it can't be done, Chair, um, from my point of view. And the last question was concerning Botswana, and I just went and read about um, Botswana. I'm not an expert on it. Um, they were removed from the, the grey list by FATF um, after they joined the South, Southern African Anti-Money Laundering Group, which then has an oversight and will deal with certain areas to strengthen their uh, anti-money laundering and counter uh, finance of terrorism regime um, through that body. So I think that's very broad chair that are not really going into why Botswana was delisted and what they did for that. Um, so I, that's basically just what I found and I put the, the reference there for members, um, the two resources I used on, on the footnote. Chair, that is, um, that's my pop. If there's any questions, I can take it now or I can take it when I'm back. And thank you very much for um, hearing me. Well, we've got about seven minutes before you leave. Am I right? You're leaving at 10. Yes, to... yes, yes. Well, you right. just get up promptly and leave because you've got a commitment to your children, obviously. That's okay. not an issue. You can always come back if need be. Yes. And also Thursday. All right. Members, hands up on the questions on the legality. Is there any hand up? Are there any people from our side? who have any questions or difference of view on what Frank has just said. I don't see anybody in Kulileko. Am I right? Not at all, Chaperson. Yeah, no, yeah. So basically, apart from the specifics around Botswana, much of what you say, I'm not a lawyer, but I've been around a long time. And in many ways, we've listened to you and other lawyers, including from the executive. And so you get a sense after all these years here about the legal issues. And, you know, apart from what actually happened in Botswana, for the rest of it, it resonates with me. But look, I'm no lawyer. So if anybody else wants to say something right now, please do when Frank comes back. But preferably now so he can get going. Any comments? So nothing. So we accept that point of view. If I see uh, uh, Treasury on the legal issues, do you want to say anything? Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, yeah. I don't know, would uh, Peter or Pruvindri like to come in at all on the on the Botswana aspect? No, leave the Botswana aspect right now. Oh, the, the, okay. the rest of it, because he's leaving now, I'm not sure when he reconnects with us, but for now, on the other legal issues about actually what uh, happened... I think we would Botswana strongly is. agree with, with Advocate Jenkins's assessment. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anybody else want to say anything, Peter? Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and, uh, and members. Uh, no, I, we, as Janine said, we fully agree with uh, Mr. Jenkins' okay. assessment. Okay, right. Uh, Frank, you can leave. It's 45. You can stay for another five minutes. It's your call, but you're not obliged to be here. Anyway, over to you then, uh, Peter, on the Botswana matter. Uh, Mr. Chair, yes. Uh, I think um, Mr. Jenkins is, is partly correct. Uh, the, um, but Botswana is a member of the Eastern and Southern Africa Anti-Money Laundering Group, which is a sister body to the Financial Action Task Force um, for this region of Southern Africa and Eastern Africa. And Botswana has been a long-standing member of this organization, uh, as is South Africa and, and, and other countries uh, around us um, in, in, in Southern Africa and Eastern Africa. Um, the Eastern and Southern Africa Anti-Money Laundering Group carries out mutual valuation similar to the FATF. Uh, so in other words, it, it applies the same standard, the same methodology, and it assesses its own members in the same way that the FATF assesses uh, its members. Um, and it was on the basis of the results of that mutual valuation that the Eastern and Southern Africa Anti-Money Laundering Group had done uh, in respect of mm -hmm. Botswana, I think it was probably in, in, around 2018 or 19. 
um, that Botswana was then grey listed by the FATF. Uh, the results of the MIT evaluation that was done by the, uh, the Eastern and Southern Africa Anti-Money Laundering Group pointed to a large number of deficiencies uh, in, in the case of Botswana. And um, Botswana was then grey listed in the same process that South Africa is currently facing in the FATF. Um, after the grey listing, uh, Botswana then addressed uh, the deficiencies to, to a very significant extent. Um, and uh, it was around uh, October 2020, if I remember correctly, or November 2020, uh, that the FATF then agreed that Botswana had done enough uh, for the FATF to uh, uh, end the monitoring of uh, Botswana and the, the removal of Botswana from the grey list. And for the Eastern and Southern Africa and the Money Laundry Group, which of which Botswana is a member, then to continue with the monitoring of the further uh, processes that Botswana still need to undertake to, to address the remaining deficiencies. Um, so it doesn't mean that Botswana has fixed everything that they needed to at the time when they were grey listed, but they've done enough in respect of the material aspects of the, um, the, the shortcomings for the FATF then to say, we, ne we need no longer to monitor Botswana. We can uh, leave that now to the SMLAC uh, organization to continue. Um, I tried to look for the mutual evaluation reports and the findings, um, but I haven't had uh, time to locate that and to, to check specifically on the issue of credit providers and whether that was an issue that featured in the Botswana mutual evaluation. It certainly did not feature in, in the follow-up process and the follow-up reports that I could find for Botswana. Um, where the FATF had to consider whether to uh, when to grey list Botswana and when to remove Botswana from the grey list. So this, this was not really an issue that determined the outcome for Botswana either to be grey listed or to be removed from the grey list. Um, as I said, Botswana did a significant amount of work in a very short space of time across almost all the FATF recommendations um, uh, that it had to, to address. Um, so it would not have been a, an issue as discrete as this one. Uh, that would have determined the, the fate for Botswana in, in the grey listing process. Um, the fact of the matter is if uh, the uh, Botswana uh, legislation currently um, uh, covers credit providers, then it would be in line with the FATF. If it, if it doesn't, uh, then there would still be further work that Botswana would have to do in its, its remaining follow-up process. And uh, that, that is still then would be monitored by, by the Eastern and Southern Africa Anti-Money Laundering Group. Um, it would not be something that FATF would take any further interest in because FATF is uh, uh, basically dispensed with their process as far as, far as Botswana is concerned. So that, that's, uh, I think, as, as far as we can take the discussion for Botswana. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Look, we were given the mutual evaluation report, it's October 2021, right? it's the one that deals with uh, Eastern and Southern Africa on empty monetary laundering group. Now, this is the one thing I didn't read, actually. 240 pages, and you know what? No, uh, I got too much more on my plate, political by the way, not personal, that required me to attend. And I said, this is not for me. This, if anybody, it's for the technicians on the side of parliament and the executive. So I didn't read this, but there it is, colleagues, you've got it. Anyway, that's it. I don't think we want to take this further unless there are any more comments and questions. No, all right. Now, Treasury, over to you and FIC to present your, an overview of what you've given us last week. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm just going to put up the presentation. Oh, um, uh, would it be possible for the secretary to allow screen sharing? Thank you. Why would it not be possible, Janina? How long have you been in this parliament? No, I, I've- uh, record, That's wonderful. He doesn't he always cooperate with you? <laughs> so what's the problem? <laughs> Will it be possible, you ask? Instead of saying, won't you please, in Kuleleko? <laughs> but you want asking a deep question. Will it be possible? Now, you know the answer to that. But it is possible. Right, Jenny, go for it. Right. Thank you very much. And thank you, members, for the opportunity to, to meet with you again today. So uh, we'll, we'll try to go through our document uh, relatively briefly, uh, not to go into gory detail, but uh, if gory detail, uh, <laughs> but if but if but if members would have any questions as we go along, please.
Yeah, yeah they can interrupt. Yeah. Questions. Thank you. They're normally very rude to the chairperson, but they're civil when it comes to the rest of you. So let's see. So uh, this document uh, provides a bit more uh, detail in relation to a few points that were noted in the document that the committee had circulated and asked for some comments yes. and responses on, on the 23rd of September. So the first point that is, is noted is to give a bit more background regarding the the, you know, the mutual evaluation report uh, and process that had sort of led to the, included the recommendations that ultimately informed the proposed amendments to schedule the schedules to the FIC Act. And it's, it's noted that, um, that these amendments are intended to de deal with the identified deficiencies relating to the scope of the regulatory framework and, and that uh, the, the widening of the scope as proposed and reorganizing the structure of supervisory bodies through the proposed amendments would appropriately address the, the issues that were identified in relating to the customer due diligence recommendations, as well as some weaknesses in relation to supervision and enforcement. Uh, these are particularly outcomes three and four that were noted in the report. The next point uh, relates to the a query that related to the aspect of trust service providers. And it's noted that the proposed amendment is intended to deal with a specific recommendation in the mutual evaluation report that requires the inclusion of certain activities relating to trust and company service providers, including accountants. And it only deals with trust service providers as accountable institutions uh, currently. And so there was a deficiency identified in that regard. And so this amendment will see that trust company, trust and company service providers, including accountants, Will, will fall under the scope of item two as accountable institutions. Then uh, the next point that's noted is in relation to uh, the recommendation at paragraph 4.1 that it was recommended that the FIC should consider applying a differentiated approach, which takes into this account the size of credit turnover and does not exclude marginalized people rather than a, the current one size fits all approach. And so um, we, would, we would just note that the, the risk-based approach, which was established under the, the amendments to the FIC Act in 2017 and the repeal of a significant proportion of the money laundering and terrorist financing control regulations and the withdrawal of, of certain exemptions uh, provided a move to a risk-based approach, which is much more flexible. And it also uh, allows quite a degree of differentiation uh, among the different types of institutions based on the, the inherent money laundering and terrorist financing risks, the types of clients of the specific institution and the products that are being offered to the particular institution. So there aren't hard coded requirements and the, the appropriate um, approach will be uh, determined based on, on each institution and will differ from one institution to another. So there, there, it's not contemplated that there would be an, an application of the rules-based approach where small business or, or businesses whose products and services uh, constitute lower risk in relation to money laundering and terrorist financing uh, and proliferation financing would deal, uh, would need to deal with compliance in the same manner as large businesses with high, high degree of, of risks in this regard. We, we do note that um, it, it was highlighted by the NCRF that uh, their, their observation is that in, in this case, market product practice is in fact different and, and that uh, there, 
you know, there isn't really a flexible approach uh, adopted in, in practice. And so um, it, it's, it's possible that the approach that has been observed may be more attributable um, to, the, to the fact that um, the, the members with, of NCRF have been dealing more in relation to the requirements in relation to credit legislation and you know, the requirements that in businesses apply in relation to those requirements, which are different from those, uh, the risk-based approach that's applied under the FIC Act. And so uh, we do acknowledge those comments. Yeah, Janine, yeah. Janine, can I just come in here? Colleagues, I think instead of trying to respond at the end, please just interrupt. You don't have to put your hand up and all. I mean, what difference does it make? You're a member of this committee. If you have a point of view, just come in. No one's going to chop your neck off. We're not going to some bizarre protocol in a virtual context, a virtual meeting. Moreover, these are all quite, you know, weighty things in their own right. Now, I read this document. I have my own views on it, which I don't think I should prejudge the outcome of what the committee members say. But I really think, colleagues, each point, if anybody wants to respond, it's better to do it then rather than at the end. But if you choose to come back at the end on the issues, fine. But then we have to keep going up to, you know, paragraph four, et cetera. All I'm saying is, colleagues, please, just in, come into the meeting. Janine will, will, obviously, once she's finished her point, Janine will respond to you or whoever wants to respond from their side. Okay, good. Right, let's move on. Sorry about that, Janine. I, I see that there is a bullet sunny. Oh. Raised a ah, hand. My friend, thanks for coming in. Don't even raise your hand, my brother. Do what you do at EFF meetings. <laughs> I'm teasing you. Oh, okay. we, we always raise, uh, raise hands. Ah, so yeah, there, yeah. There must be, there must be an order. Okay. <laughs> uh, I do okay. Okay, okay, my brother. <laughs> Go for it. No, thank now, you, Chairperson. Don't be rude about the EFF right <laughs> now. Not this EFF member. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Chairperson. Looking at 1.4, it says that uh, the, uh, the National Treasury reiterates that there, there is not one size fits all. I just yeah. wanted to check whether that recommendation for 1.3, uh, is it possible for implementation? Thank you. All right, very good point. Now, where are we with others? Where's Dennis today? Planning the 2024 election. In his head right Absolutely, now. Absolutely, Chair. We're busy with strategy. <laughs> Don't waste your time, man. Don't waste your time. <laughs> Do something productive. Engage with this paragraph. Okay, next point. Um, uh, just to respond to the question, um, yeah. thank you very much. Um, so, so already under the the, the legislative framework, um, it. it it, it, it really should be definitely not a one size fits all approach that's applied. It should be based on each particular institution. And, and um, you know, then there's also guidance that's issued as well to inform the implementation of the risk-based approach. And, and so ideally it should be, a, a, you know, sort of the opposite of a one size fits all approach. I don't know if Peter or Pruvindri would want to come in on that point. Peter? Um, yes, thank you, Janine. I think just to confirm, um, and I think to reiterate the point that the FIC Act actually um, requires institutions not to apply a one-size-fits-all uh, uh, approach. Uh, application of a one-size-fits-all approach or a rules-based approach would be non-compliance with the FIC Act because the FIC Act requires a differentiated approach based, based on an understanding of risk. Um, and the FIC Act also then expects that when supervisors test compliance by institutions, that supervisors will follow the same uh, uh, approach of uh, understanding the institution's risk and uh, uh, um, understanding how the institution would uh, meet the risk re mitigation requirements in, in accordance with the um, the, the institution's express, expression of how it understands its risk. So the, the whole risk-based approach is in, ingrained in the manner in which the FIC Act must be complied with. It, it cannot be complied with in a, in a one-size-fits-all uh, process. 
Um, I think just to also um, make the point that um, the um, guidance that the FIC had issued uh, in 2017, soon after the, the last amendments to the FIC Act, um, very expressly made the point that institutions are not restricted to making use of specific documents or specific information or specific means to identify their customers or to verify their customers' uh, identities. Um, so the messaging that was um, communicated to the institutions that have to comply with the FIC Act uh, from 2017 onwards has been very consistent that um, there is no one manner in which institutions must comply with the FIC Act. Um, institutions are required to apply their mind to each uh, scenario and make use of the best uh, means at their disposal to comply with uh, um, requirements such as identifying their customers and verifying the customers' identities. Um, if market practice is that some institutions are requiring a, a proof of an address uh, as a means to achieve that, then that is done by that institution's own choice. Um, but there's clear and most certainly been no expression from the FIC side or from the supervisory community side that that's an expectation that we want to see institutions apply. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Janine. Uh, Janine, just one thing before we go to you. As far as the team that put our report together, I know they don't like to speak in the meeting, though they're welcome to do so. So if they want to raise any questions or they're unhappy with what Tracy is saying, please put your comments in the chat group, or if you want, you can send it to me and I will say, look, this is what our staff feel, uh, without mentioning any names. While I'm at it, Poppy and Taka's not here because she's got exams and she doesn't study leave, and I obviously wish her well. But please, the staff on our side, including Esther, if you've got any issues that you feel have not been responded to or you've got a follow up, please put it in the chat group if you don't want to say anything. Okay, over then to you, Janine, thank you. So we would certainly note the, the, the uh, submissions by the NCRF uh, about the practices that they've observed. And, and, so, um, and so we would highlight that, you know, it would be very important that, um, you know, that, that there will be an effort made through super, uh, clarification of supervisory expectations, engagement, and, and got provision of guidance. And, and we recognize that this will be very important and, and should be emphasized and, and really uh, worked upon going forward. So we certainly take note of that. And, and you know, in order to ensure the appropriate implementation of the risk-based approach going forward. And, and so, um, you know, we would, we certainly would note that and, and the importance of, of these sorts of measures you know, to ensure a better uh, and appropriate application of the risk-based approach going forward. And, uh, you know, there, there, there are guidance notes that are currently have been issued um, in relation to the application of the risk-based approach, but certainly it would be appropriate to, you know, ensure, you know, monitor and ensure that there is appropriate uh, guidance uh, going forward and that the you know, so that the, the application of the risk-based approach can be achieved successfully and appropriately. Then, um, then go the ahead. Next... If anybody wants to speak, they'll button or they'll raise their hand and Nicolette will direct me to that. Thank you, go ahead. Uh, thank you. So the next point um, that, that we would note is that um, the, the proposed amendments to the schedules have been a result of a very lengthy consultation process and certainly not ha, have not been uh, just strictly a result of, of a, a really uh, poorly uh, considered and an urgent response to possible grey listing. The consultation process commenced in March 2017 and there were consultations with various sectors and supervisory bodies um, until 2019, then there was a, a significant public consultation process in 2020. And, and then all of those comments were really scrutinized and, and assessed 
in, in developing the final proposed amendments that were submitted to Parliament. So, so we would just note that this has been a, a very lengthy process of development. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then um, in relation to paragraph 4.6, it's noted that there are no carve outs for schedule one items, similar to what the NCRF has relating to credit providers. Uh, item eight, which has been referred to deals with life insurance businesses that are already accountable institutions and the amendments excludes the insurance business, which is a, a quite a different sort of insurance business from other types of ordinary insurance. And, and this business, this is business uh, received from existing accountable institutions and is not a business that happens between businesses and the public, as would be the case in, re in relation to the requested carve out that the NCRF has proposed. In relation to uh, paragraph 4.8, um, we have just referred to uh, some useful material regarding the, the European Union's uh, assessment of high-risk third countries with strategic deficiencies in anti-money laundering and, and counter-terrorist risk financing regimes, uh, and that's the European blacklist. So there's a bit of, just referring to a bit of additional information that might be relevant in considering the submissions that have been provided. And then, then there were some specific in, uh, issues that we were requested to consider and provide some responses to. And, and the first one is in relation to the FIC's response to the financial implications of the proposed amendments and how could the risks to financial customers and SMMEs be mitigated? <clears throat> Excuse me. And so uh, during the sub, uh, sessions with the Select Committee on Finance, the NCRF made some submissions regarding the, the costs that would be between 25 Rand to 30 Rand per credit applicant. And this appears to be the initial costs that business, businesses estimated. And the National Treasury um, has, ha, has indicates this potentially may not necessarily be um, an accurate assessment of costs. And because the majority of relationships with customers in the sector could be classified as low risk and so quite simplified due diligence may, would be justified in relation to those customers. And an accountable institution may determine that it will conduct simplified due diligence by obtaining certain customer identity particulars such as surname and ID number and verifying these in relation to an identity document. And credit providers, uh, have already obtained this information from their existing customers um, could choose to continue using the existing information that they already verified and would not <laughs> necessarily have to repeat the exercise uh, to again comply with FIC requirements. And there, there may be some uh, obligations that uh, might be applicable, uh, such as ensuring that a risk management and compliance program uh, would be in place and providing some training to staff members. Um, but, you know, the, <coughs> excuse me, but the, those uh, particular costs um, would not necessarily be able to be easily, the FIC is not able to quantify those. <coughs> um, but uh, once such measures have been implemented, then there shouldn't be substantial ongoing uh, costs that would need to be incurred by, by credit providers. And then uh, there was a qu question of the retrospective application of the FIC Act. And as that might result in additional costs, 
<laughs> and it's noted uh, the, the specific section 21 subsection two was a transitional provision that was applicable when the, in, the FIC Act entered into force and would not be applicable in relation to the implementation of these schedules. And the information already collected by credit providers before credit is provided to a customer is much more <coughs> than what is required for a simplified due diligence in respect of a low risk customer. And the credit provider already collects uh, this sort of information and, and, and so, you know, there shouldn't be substantial additional information that would need to be collected from, from individuals beyond what credit providers are already collecting. Uh, a second question was, what would the impact be if the FIC considers some of the recommendations made, such as excluding certain types of products, limiting the transactions to the value of 100,000 Rand instead of payment in any form, excluding some sectors considered low risk, uh, the retail sector SMMEs, the agriculture sector, and considering a transitional period for implementation of the proposed amendment uh, to provide new accountable institutions sufficient time to implement and comply with the provisions of the Financial Intelligence Center Act. So uh, with respect to the item relating to including high value goods dealers, the FATF standards include non-financial non-financial businesses that should be covered by a country's legislation against money laundering and terrorist financing, such as casinos, estate agents, trust and company service providers, and dealers in precious metals and uh, precious stones. And, and these are businesses which are not covered at all by the scope of Schedule 1 to the FIC Act. And in relation to uh, carve-outs, the application of a risk-based approach, um, you know, is, is intended to provide a, a nuanced approach to, to uh, the application of requirements. And, and so, um, you know, then it's, this then approach is, is sort of, uh, differs from providing a, a lot significant carve-outs and trying to provide an overall very nuanced and proportionate approach to the application of the requirements, and uh, and and so it it would it's just determined you know this is the most um, sort of accurate and nuanced sort of approach to the application of requirements that can be provided for in legislation as um, you know providing for exclusions may have certain uh, consequences that may not be desirable, but also um, providing you know, a blanket application of rules to uh, in institutions you know, without any uh, differentiation would also uh, certainly uh, result in, in severe consequences that wouldn't be appropriate either. It would be a huge loss of information to the FIC if transactions were limited to cash only. Um, and it's unlikely that a customer would use 100,000 Rand in cash to purchase a high value item, such as a, a vehicle or jewelry. And by including payments in any form, then it, it uh, provides for an accurate assessment of, of the purchasing power of individuals and over, you know, through, by observing various methods of payment. Once the amendments uh, may be approved and enter into force, Inspections will only commence uh, after a window period of 12 to 18 months. So this, this is intended to provide a period for newly accountable institutions to be able to um, implement appropriate measures uh, and, and to be able to comply and guidance aimed at clearly communicating supervisory ex expectations and approaches will take place during this period um, to 
provide support for new accountable institutions to understand their obligations. Another question was uh, criteria to identify which credit providers or types of credit providers are included or excluded, or is everything based on the FATF standards? In respect of item 11, that relates to credit providers in schedule one, the current coverage of credit providers was inadequate and did not include all the types of credit providers that is required by the FATF standards. And these standards require that all types of financial institutions be covered by the scope of the anti-money laundering counter financing terrorism framework. And this includes those activity, those entities that provide lending. And, and this includes consumer credit and mortgage credit. And no exclusions are threat and th or thresholds are identified in the FATF standards for this item. And the legal reference point in, in South African law for the inclusion of credit providers in the scope of the FIC Act, uh, which is the National Credit Act, defines the relevant terminology. That is, it defines what is a credit facility in broad terms, uh, which then makes it difficult to maintain legal certainty when attempting to refer to subcategories of credit providers within the larger categories provided for in the National Credit Act. And then um, in the absence of an independent risk assessment or study, what ways have been used to give a sense that of the extent of the level of money laundering and related activities? And has the approach been applied uh, to various types of lending institutions? Uh, perhaps I could please ask Peter uh, to come in on, on, this, on this point. Thank you, Janine. I, I think just to reiterate the framework of the, uh, how the FATF standards work and what room for discretion it allows to countries um, to deviate from, from the standards um, and then how risk and risk assessment uh, plays into that uh, decision-making process. The point of departure is that if a, the FATF standard sets a requirement to cover a particular industry or sector um, in a country's uh, anti-money laundering terror financing framework, then the country uh, must cover that in, the, in its full scope in the way that it's defined in, in the FATF standard. A country has the discretion to deviate from that if the country can prove that there is, and, and the FATF uses the, the terminology proven low risk in that sector. Now, in our experience and our discussions with, with uh, um, uh, the FATF in the context of mutual valuations, proven low risk means that the, the country, the, the, the risk must be negligible and must be of such a nature that it has no material impact on the efficacy of the country's anti-money laundering terror financing uh, measures. So even if there is low risk, that risk needs to be managed and the uh, risk needs to be uh, ad addressed through the anti-money laundering terror financing framework in the country and the legislation such as the FIC Act in, in the case of, of South Africa that would provide for institutions to apply the type of risk-based approach that we've, we've uh, discussed before. So the, a country does not is, um, require, or the FATF standard does not require the country to do an, a risk assessment in order to decide whether something should be included in its uh, anti-money laundering framework or not, if what is uh, um, disc under discussion is already covered by the FATF standard and this is uh, required to, to be addressed in, in the anti-money laundering framework in, in a country. Um, so, for instance, banks, um, uh, insurance companies, traders in, in uh, um, stock uh, and on the stock market, financial services advisors, all of those are identified by the FATF standards and must be applied, included in the country's uh, anti-money laundering framework. And a country does not need to do a case-by-case -case risk assessment for each of those sectors to decide whether to include it or not. And in our case, we, we did not uh, go through such a process in respect of all the items that are covered in the FIC Act schedule, um, which are also covered by the FATF standards. 
uh, a country is also to require required under the FATF standard to include in, uh, categories of business that are not covered by the FATF standard and others that are not mentioned in the FATF standards if such a, a, a type of business provide a particular risk profile in, in that country. Um, so even businesses or sectors that are not mentioned in the, in the FATF standard uh, must be covered in a country's uh, anti-money laundering framework, and this is part of the FATF standard, uh, the requirements, if the country's own risk assessment shows that there's a, a material risk that needs to be managed. Now, in, uh, one example for, the, uh, for South Africa, for instance, is where we have uh, assessed whether to include um, uh, short-term insurance. In other words, uh, not life insurance, but uh, risk insurance of property uh, against theft and damage and so on, um, uh, which is not covered by the FATF standard. The FATF doesn't require countries to, to cover that type of insurance business, but South Africa did a risk assessment to determine whether there's a risk that need, we need, believe need to be managed. And in the end, that risk assessment process uh, showed that there is not uh, a justification for us to include this type of insurance business in the FOC Act scope, um, but that there is a need for us to have a, a, a constructive uh, information sharing arrangements with providers of short-term insurance for the FOC and the investigating authorities to access information about insurance policies and all this of, of those policies. So that, that's one example of, of how risk assessment works in, in the context of, of the FATF standards. This means that in, in the case of lending business, uh, uh, which as defined and as Janina just described in, in the FATF standard, um, South Africa would only be able to exclude a, a, a category of lending business if we uh, ourselves are convinced that there's no risk in that area that has a material impact on our money laundering framework and that we can make a credible argument uh, in an assessment uh, to, to that effect, uh, that would mean then mean it would not have any bearing on our compliance with, with the FATF standards. Now, in our case, we are not convinced that there is such an argument to be made in respect of uh, any category of, the, of lending business, even where there's low risk, uh, we believe there is uh, still scope for that risk to be managed in terms of the FOC Act requirements. And that's the discussion we had just a bit earlier on, on what that implies for uh, providers of, of uh, lending business in, in that low uh, risk category. Um, and I think as, as Janine had already mentioned, um, in that low risk category where we do believe risk needs to be managed, we believe it can be managed through simplified measures that uh, are already aligned with the way in which credit providers uh, uh, conduct business with their customers, uh, form uh, business relationships and, and the type of information that uh, credit providers obtain and hold of, of their customers uh, when they, they extend credit to them. So Janine, I hope that covers. Uh, I'll be happy to, to expand if, if, if you want me to. Thanks. Thank you very much, Peter. So I think uh, Peter has covered that point. And then, then there was- uh, a Just question. one second. Uh, the chair of the, uh, what's it, uh, Sikoa says that she, I think she's fading, uh, Peter, and, and maybe you should switch your video off. But I think, uh, Comrade Chair, you, you um, maybe it's on your side, because at least on my side, um, it was fine. So it's possible on your side. I don't know if others had the problem, but... Um, you know, anybody else had that problem? No. And basically, Chairperson uh, 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 Mashlangu, uh, what happened here is uh, Peter just added to what Janine said, right? And uh, if anybody else wants to pick up on the issue, heard him completely, then they could. But uh, he just amplified the point. I'm sorry that you having that problem, but uh, obviously uh, on our side, we, nobody, Dennis always intervenes and says he, he, he can't or somebody does. So I think it's, it's really on your side possibly. Okay, let's go on, thank you. Chairperson. Yeah, it's all. Muletzani. Yeah. Muletzani. Yes, my friend, yeah. Uh, something is bothering me in my mind. I just want to check here. Uh, Please, yes, uh, go ahead. If, if, if the credit providers are asking for proof of address, uh, there will be no uh, exclusion of a last segment of the South African consumers uh, by unintended maybe consequences. Thank you. 
Yeah, look, uh, Comrade Bolisar, we, we are all uh, feeling like that, but we'll go into discussing uh, policy issues around that. But Janine and Peter and whoever else wants to come in, please reply to that. Um, thank you, Mr. Chow. Just give a quick response to that. We, we fully agree with that point of view. If, if credit providers are insisting on a proof of address, that would be uh, um, would exclude a large, uh, a significant portion of our uh, population that rely on credit uh, to uh, support basic um, uh, lifestyle requirements, um, buying food, buying uh, clothing, etc. Um, but. Our point that the point that we were making earlier is that if credit providers are insisting on uh, having a proof of address, they are not doing so because they have to comply with the FIC Act. The FIC Act has no such requirement, and we've been communicating that as as widely and as as uh, emphatically as possible over the last few years um, that there is no such a requirement uh, to to obtain a proof of address. So if credit providers are do so, they are doing so, they are doing it for a different purpose and for, for a, a different reason. Um, we would not encourage them to do that, uh, to, to require proof of address. Um, that's contrary to the messaging that the FIC has been communicating in its guidance. Uh, and we would agree that yeah, that is exclusionary and that does not serve the purpose uh, for um, the re why we want institutions to identify customers and why we want people in uh, conducting their business within a regulated environment that uh, is transparent. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll end it. Yeah, uh, uh, they've been raising that from day one, that it's not a requirement. And they've also responded, obviously, to the issue of how much it's going to cost and all that. But we will look at that when we look overall at policy issues. But please, comrades, colleagues, just feel free to, to raise the issues. Um, as you want to, even if for the 20th time, there's no harm, you, you must get clarity. So just feel free to raise them. Till the very last moment we vote on the bill. Okay, then let's go on, please. Who's, who's uh, you, Janine, you coming in now, or is it Peter? Janine, it's yourself probably. Mm. Um, uh, Chair, I think yeah. I saw Honorable Ryder's hand raised. Oh, right. Uh, not to worry, Chair. I'll, I'll, I'd rather wait until the end and then I'll, I'll, I'll make one more okay. contribution. Okay, all right. Fine. Go for it, Jane. Well, you're very uh, close to the end anyway. Yes, thank you. Um, so then there, there's a brief response to a query about uh, money remitters, which are included in item 19. And the proposed amendments uh, it seeks to address a deficiency identified that it doesn't, that the current uh, uh, phrasing of the item does not cover the concept of money or value transfer providers as is described in the FETF standard. And so, so currently the, the item covers authorized dealers such as banks, authorized dealers with limited authority, such as money remitters other than banks that are required to be authorized by the South African Reserve Bank. And so the, amend the amendment intends to cover informal money remittances as is required under the FATF standards. And so, so that's the purpose of, of the amendment for, for in relation to the money remitters. And then uh, just finally, we won't really go into this. This just provides a couple of clarification points um, regarding some of the guidance notices that, that were referred to uh, in, in some of the correspondence that was submitted to the committee just to provide clarification of the appropriate guidance that's currently being implemented. So that completes our, our presentation. Thank you very much, Chair and Honourable Members. All right, Dennis, go for it. Dennis. Where's Dennis? Is he disappeared? No, I'm here, Chair, sorry. Yeah. You said you wanted to raise something at the end. Go for it. Yeah, 
Oh, sorry, Chairperson, my signal is really not bad, to, not, not very good today. Yeah, good. yeah, okay, sorry about that. I'm cutting out, so uh, my apologies. Chair, I'll, I'll, look, I really want to appreciate the time that Treasury has taken to respond. Um, and, and we've gone into this with, with, with quite a lot of detail. And it's a massively technical space, once again, that, we, that, that we're dealing in. And, and I think that this is part of what's tripping us up. Now, I mean, I put together a document, a briefing document the other day for some colleagues on this, and, and I, I thought I'd put it really simply, and I was told, no, listen, that's an academic document. So, so to distill this down to, to really understandable by chunks, and I mean, you know, is, is, is certainly not easy. So, and I think this is where, where, where we're tripping up and where a lot of the criticism has come from. Uh, come from. Now, certainly in terms of the, the Vodacom submission, um, as well as a submission from the Federation, but from comments that we're reading all over the place as well, is that there's, there's insufficient understanding um, of these amendments. Um, and, and I do think that we're sitting with, with a big problem that people are, are, are fearing, uh, you know, that, that that what we're going to be doing is we're going to be making uh, kind of the guy that's that that's giving you credit for a, a 200 rand um, you know airtime voucher or whatever uh, is going to go through have to go through the same processes as the banks are going through with their FICA process and in terms of 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 the law straightforward on paper it says you've got to go through this know your client process um, and you know. Again, this risk-based, risk-weighted approach, the differentiation is not made clear uh, to, to people that are having a fairly quick look. And in fact, even people are trying to scratch a little bit more deeply. So the, the impact, and I mean, you know, there was comment from Frank about unintended uh, consequences. And the point of unintended consequences is that you seldom see them uh, and, uh, until the thing actually happens. So you, it, it's difficult to preempt them. But, but I do that, that people are, are, are really scared of, of, of the way that this has been put together and the impact that it's going to have on their businesses and are currently scurrying around. And with the likes of Vodacom uh, and, and, and the Fed Clothing Federation as well, um, you know they've they've engaged attorneys. They they're paying, and it wasn't it wasn't small town attorneys. These were these were serious players um, who were also you know struggling with some of these the the uh, understanding of the impact of, of of what's being asked for. So I think that there's considerable work that needs to be done in terms of making the detail understandable. And this certainly is in order to ensure that the implementation of these regulations uh, isn't taken you know, way too far. And one of the concerns I have with that is that you know, if we go ahead and we pass a set of regulations that are deemed to be incredibly onerous uh, and to place a big burden uh, and burden of compliance onto, on, on, onto businesses all over the place. First of all, we're going to make doing business quite difficult in South Africa, or the perception. And we must always remember that we're talking about perceptions, because you know there was a perception that uh, uh, certain labor regulations are incredibly onerous, uh, when in fact, in practice, they're less onerous than than than. than what, what the rumors are out there. But the perception that gets created acts as a barrier to entry to many people. And so I think that we're sitting in a situation where potentially people are going to go, and I made this point last time as well, people are going to take the most conservative interpretation of every part of these regulations and apply that. Because the penalties for not applying it, the penalties for not complying are swift and extreme. And we only need to look at the penalties that the FIC has placed uh, on the various banks to see this. It has a massive financial implication to, to, to the banks who, let's be honest, in my experience, uh, have 
spent a great deal of money and time and effort to comply with the FIC regulations and are still caught up. Uh, you know, the, the fines that, that got laid out, I think it was Standard Bank and NetBank that got fined recently, and, and they were big numbers. But I know because, you know, I worked at NetBank for a long time uh, and I, I continue to bank with them. I know that they take FICA extremely seriously. I know that they have compliance officers that work for them that are highly paid, legally trained professionals. And yet still, there's little ways to trip them up. So I do think that there's a great deal of clarity that needs to get put forward uh, in terms of supporting documents, in terms of roadshows with different entities, in terms of of informing the people that you're expecting to comply with the regulations. Because at this stage, we don't have that. And there's general disagreement uh, in terms of many of the, 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 the definitions and, 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 and the understanding of how to implement the requirements. What this brings me to, Chair, is the fact that we all understand that grey listing hangs over our heads, and this is part of what needs to be done to, to try and deal with that. And I need to ask a, 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 a fairly tough question, is that, you know, it's almost certain we will be grey listed, uh, according to, to, to my research and, and uh, many of the people that I've spoken to. The point is then to get ourselves out as quickly as possible. And I do think that there are lessons to be learned from the likes of Botswana, et cetera. However, if we go and we put in regulations that are too much of a broad swathe, so knee jerk uh, has been has has been the phrase that's that's been used already, and perhaps that might be a little bit unfair. It's not a knee jerk, but it's a broad swathe that we're cutting, and we are. Uh, essentially using a, a blunt instrument in order to, 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 to try and quickly turn around this perception that South Africa is a high risk and we, we want to avoid uh, um, gray listing. So, so if we do go with this broad sway and, 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 and we use this blunt instrument and we then find that compliance with these regulations is expensive, difficult, in some cases maybe unattainable even, etc. Does that not impact our ability to extract ourselves from that gray list uh, in the medium term, if not the short? Um, and I'm wondering if perhaps a slightly more finely tuned set of regulations wouldn't be more appropriate uh, um, in order to, to, to ensure that we, we don't create a, um, a benchmark that's too high uh for for south african uh, uh you know corporates to to comply with or for ourselves as government or yourselves as government to comply with um so i i'm, I'm concerned about that but i really do feel chair that that the 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 regulations as they stand now need you know substantial additional information to back them up uh, and then, as I say, a, a big effort to educate the people that the regulations are aimed at. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. Who's next? Okay. While uh, waiting for others, um, firstly, um, <clears throat> well, obviously, in assessing this document, uh, Janine, as I understand it, the other is a back. A sort of background document, right? The full list of responses you got from the uh, original uh, publication in the Gazette of the uh, bill, right? Is that correct? That's 64 page document. Am I correct? Ginny? Peter? Um, yes, uh, thank you. Um, yes, uh, we did circulate. Uh, that was the the document that indicates the comments that were received and uh, responses to those comments in relation to the public consultation process that was held prior to um, the finalization of the 
yes. uh, schedules for tabling in Parliament, yes. Yeah, the 64 page one. Okay, look, I looked at that. I certainly didn't need 64 pages. But the reason I say this is because in addition to what you said, there is that document, right? Where there's quite an elaborate reply, okay? To all the submissions made. Everyone is detailed that we know of. Well, we, there may be more that you have mentioned, but where well, we take it that that is every one or every significant one or even minor, minimally significant one. And you've replied to it and you spelled out the process now and originally. And we've gone through the NA process. And I just feel that um, we have to take that into account, what I call a long concentration. Secondly, in evaluating this, and if the content advisor or anybody else wants to comment, as I said, you can put something in the chat group or send me a WhatsApp. I take it that unless you do, that, um, well, you're fine with it because it's a response to the document you prepared. So obviously when you look at the document, you have to compare it to what came from the Federation the last time they were here and in written form today. And uh, not to make too fine a point of it, overall, I, I'm not a technical expert, but the case presented by Tracy and FIC seems to me to be stronger than the case presented by Federation. And that's what I think, if you look at the document coming from Esther and them, says, we're gonna go to that in a moment. So I just want to say also that um, we should be slightly, uh, well, I don't know, I'm not speaking about Dennis specifically, but separate out the confusion and lack of clarity and use of terms that are not very precise. That's being commented on the media, which relate to the bill that's currently before the NA, which is coming to us soon rather than this particular bill before us. Although I accept that this too has created complications. Now it's interesting that where Dennis and I agree is uh, on the need for like some sort of public dissemination, uh, simplicity, simplicity thing. We also, I think, agree, I'm sure most of us here will as a whole in this committee, that it's a very technically difficult bill. But we also need to separate out what our view on the policy issues are from our concern about the lack of clarity. And obviously, it's a tendency, we would do it ourselves if we were stakeholders, to like say, ah, oh, if you oppose something on policy grounds, and in the case of the Federation, it seems to me that's primarily their gripe. It's not the lack of clarity completely. So, you know, we need to separate out when people oppose something because of its policy, on policy grounds, and then say, well, it's not even clear, which becomes like an add-on to what's the real concern. Uh, I, I, I will come back about my own views in a moment, but unless anybody else has anything to say, I think we should move to the document that's come from our own research unit. So, or team. So basically, is there anybody else who wants to say something on what Treasury said before we move on to that? Well, we're gonna always come back because they're all related and the idea was to hear them all, but as things panned out, this is how we dealt with them. So then let's go to the document from our team and that I read keenly and uh, Right, here we are, Parliament one, it's five pages. So basically uh, the first uh, one, two, three, basically deals with the amendments and what they are. Then let's go to uh, section three. So it's explained very clearly that schedule one items 11, 19 and 20 deal with the inclusion of credit providers, money remittances and high value goods, right, respectively. And those are the ones that are issued. It's interesting that 
the main or the key issues that remain are very few compared to what was raised in that 64 page document and responded to by Treasury. Then on the main issue three one, the key concern is obviously the blanket inclusion of credit providers, but then note that uh, uh, NT and FIC, as I've said, responded that the terms of the newly proposed wording are not defined in the National Credit Act. Anyway, emphasis was made that the category of credit lending was non-negotiable under the FATF rules. Now, unless we can prove that this is not the case, colleagues, I think it was accepted. So anybody has a problem with this, that this is, you know, that the, the Federation argues otherwise, but this is what, you know, is, is the key issue really. And that the carve outs they go on to say would create an untenable precedent that could lead to many other requests for carve outs. And on this, I absolutely agree, right? There are no examples, they also say internationally, where there have been carve outs provided in primary legislation including where there are financial inclusion concerns and that the EU's fifth anti-money laundering directive includes credit institutions without setting thresholds or having exclusions. Now, colleagues, is there anybody who disputes this? Because this is like, you know, we're reaching now finalizing policy issues because I don't think we should carry on going on. Dennis, you were quite useful in setting out the way forward, but you haven't, as far as I can see at this stage, said there are policy issues here at stake. Although your caucus or whoever decides these things with you might otherwise agree. Now, the potential unintended consequences, we've dealt with that extensively. Then the requirement for the proof of the address, once again, the FIC has clarified this today, right? It's not something that they have to do. Cost of compliance, I mean, to be quite frank, they have given us, the Federation, no substantial projections, even not precise figures. So I don't know. On this one, I've got no view. All I know is that the Federation hasn't come to the party, so to speak. Whether the Treasury is right about this, I don't know. I don't know who knows. Then on the issue of constitutionality, we've covered that constitutionality. And Frank dealt with a great length, and we seem to be agreeing with it almost unanimously. Then the issue of uh, an SRA study, what are they saying? The only basis for the exclusion of a sector that is covered by FATA standards is in a particular scenario, there's no risk of money laundering or terrorist funding, and there's no requirement, not very like compulsory to do the SRA. Personally, though, I would have preferred that, but I know there are very many uh, problems. Then on the issue of best practice, our team points to Botswana and Namibia, and what the FI has to say. I see, but you've covered that in great detail today, so that's covered. Money derivatives. The team explains to us exactly what it is. And then NT clarified that the current item 19 includes money limits and accountable institutions and that whole paragraph, which is eclipsed by what was said today. With regards to the proposed transitional period, Treasury explained that once the amendments are approved and enter into force, inspections and enforcement will only commence after a window period of 12 to 18 months. Please remember this, we keep forgetting that uh, people have 12 to 18 months to get it together and tell us. That means that Treasury has less of an excuse not to clarify this exactly. We can't prescribe to them. But what I think we can put in our report exactly, can the team here please note, right? Something like the committee, uh, you know, they can find the words, make it more elegant, but something like the committee uh, believes that the bill is extremely, take the committee's view is not believed, the committee's view is that uh, the bill is extremely complex, technically complex, and that uh, uh, full stop or something, while, while understanding the policy issues, uh, the committee believes that uh, National Treasury needs to provide greater clarity uh, to the relevant stakeholders, and if need be the public, on what precisely the provisions of the bill mean in practice. Treasury and the FIC can also engage with stakeholders to provide this clarity within the time and resources that they function within. 
Obviously, you can find better words yesterday and so on. So this is not just for the minutes, please. Eh? This is the report. And so when it comes to recommendations and observations, this is what the committee must guide the staff to do, and that's what they're expected to do, unless the majority reject it. So please, uh, we are crafting the broad, crude approach to the report in parts. So um, it doesn't go on to say also guidance aimed at clearly communicating supervised expectations and appropriate approaches will take place during the time for the new accountable. Yeah, okay, there they go on to say that, right? High value goods. And here the team has covered that quite well. And then in NTA FIC quickly responded that the FATF status includes the non-financial businesses that should be covered by a country's legislation against money, money laundering, financing, and terrorist financing, such as casinos, estate agents, trusts, and company service providers, etc., cetera, and details are provided there. So overall, there are six items, notes the staff, the, the team, uh, propose uh, six items that propose technical amendments, five are to be deleted, five items are newly proposed, and four items seek to widen the scope into each category. Then point four point two is for noting, 4.3, the inclusion of uh, credit providers, additional cost compliance, we've covered that, I think we agree. 4.4, that's noted by our staff. And 4.5, yeah, I think this is correct. Eh? We could not substantiate the nature of additional information that we just required to obtain all additional costs. They haven't even given that to us, even as a projection. 4.6, urgency and so on, 4.7, with the assertion from the FIC that the constitution was unlikely to rule, the parliamentary advice, blah, blah, the committee can recommend for the approval of amendments. Right, so that's basically the thrust of it. So broadly speaking, on the policy issues now, what are the comments, colleagues? We can start with the DA. Jay, if I may, sorry. Yeah, Thanks. sure. So, yeah, it's, <laughs> you know, it, it's it's difficult to be sitting here trying to, to evaluate some of the information. Uh, and um, yeah, with some of the allegations that have been put out and, and, and not really having much more facts. Just in terms of that cost of compliance, I would, I would love to know how accessible the home affairs system is uh to to for example a retail federation so so they said that they were using a third party provider to verify id numbers um and uh you know and, and there's there's a cost of, of of verifying per id number but i mean you know is that is, is that a choice thing or is that is 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 that something that uh um you know is is required because of i don't know maybe the poppy act restricts access to information on, on 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 the population register i don't know um but yeah I, look no, no matter what i think there is a cost of compliance what 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 it is uh you know if it's 25 rand or 30 rand i don't think really is a point um but i do know that it's going to be passed on to the consumer uh and th that's the story at the end of the day is that that the, all of this is going to end up making life more expensive for south africans um, and I think that's possibly just a point that I wanted to make. Uh, the, the other issue that we have in terms of these money remittances, you know, a, a lot of our neighboring countries have people that are working in South Africa and remit money and through all sorts of means that I certainly don't understand. Um, and uh, yeah, I wonder what the impact on that would be. With that speculation, Chair, with the information we have in front of us, I think that the the comments that we that have been put forward we may not agree on everything but uh, I, I think it's a fair a fair summary or in a, a, in a fair position that's been stated thank you uh eff do you have anything to say on the policy issues overall we are quiet for now chairperson i didn't see anybody wants to say anything Okay, while well, people are mine. Yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. I'm from Mitchell. Yes, Comrade Jadu, Comrade Dikaledi. Comrade Dikaledi can continue. No, I said I'm fine, Chair. I don't have anything to say. 
Okay. Uh, Njadu? I, I, I that's also what I want to say, Chair, that we are covered. Okay. So I take it that there's nobody opposed to, at this stage, to passing the bill. We went up to Thursday when we vote, and the report is presented to us. So if the team can have the report ready by Wednesday, 5 p.m., Thursday at 2 o'clock, there's no plenary. We don't have to meet till 5. So if we can finish within an hour or so, that'll do us. But obviously, the slot would go for three hours. So I just want to say, firstly, that um, on the basis of what I see here, uh, what I've experienced over the last four sittings or whatever on this bill, and taking into account this sort of democracy, as the English would say, it must be a Greek saying, which you like under a lot of pressure to accept this. I think it's correct that we accept the spell with reservations about the technical clarity and the sort of things that Dennis said, and I think we, in different ways, all endorse. So I, I think we, we should say in our report something like, uh, the committee is not completely at ease with every aspect of these amendments. And yet too, we can say something about and acknowledges the technical complexities that they make up or we'll find the right simpler words, I stand our team, we'll stop and then go on to say something like, uh, well, what? That um, like many bills, the, this too is a trade-off, but this has to balance a uh, requirement of the international body, the FATF, could say the majority in this committee in the next paragraph believe that as far as possible, our compliance with uh, international regulations, norms, standards, whatever, has to take into account the specific needs of our country and uh, respect our national sovereignty while recognizing we are part of the international global system and a very small part of that too. Uh, and then another thing we could note is that uh, as often, come on, we uh, are aware, as, of, as, as often, come on, the costs of compliance are borne disproportionately by the consumers. Full stop. Uh, and something like, uh, what? Uh, uh, we believe that Treasury should monitor us and we would like Treasury and the FIC to report back to us a year after. So this will be the new sixth term of parliament. What will be sixth? I can't remember. Anyway, I'm here to only 28 years. And others are here for that period too. It will through the provincial legislature. So what will it be? Seventh term of parliament, right? That's where it's going to happen. We add like up to 12 to 18 months. Uh, then it's running into the next term of parliament. But we should say that. And in theory, we have exit reports, and the same secretary hopefully will be there, and the same researcher, and uh, the same content advisor. And hopefully, they'll draw to the attention of the new chairperson that look, this is something that's outstanding, and we have to follow up on. The truth of the matter is, regrettably, often this doesn't happen. But uh, if I'm still the chair here, I will obviously alert and look or make notes of all the things, you know, as we come to six months before the end of our term, of the things that, you know, we have to notify the incoming chair. So I will do all these things, but we can't prescribe to them uh, what to do, especially as I won't even be here, mercifully. So, you know, I mean, I, I can't uh, do anything about it except plead to the chairs. Uh, and the whips to, to, to the ANC whips to take that forward. But, you know, they must report back a year after it comes into effect, okay? On what precisely is happening. Then uh, uh, we have to say that while recognizing the concern, uh, we, we, we what? 
we we recognize the you know recognizing while recognizing the likelihood of consumers having to pay a disproportionate or a major share of the costs uh, we believe that the costs of not meeting uh, fat have regulations be far more negative, including on these very uh, consumers, right? And they mentioned that um, uh, we did not get sufficient uh, evidence of what precisely the costs would be, even like projection, uh, projected figures from the Retail Federation. Pulls up, we understand that it might be uh, what? Might be uh, difficult to establish these figures, but at this stage, uh, uh, we think the costs are likely to be far less than is made out. And uh, the committee believes that uh, what? That the um, um, FIC and, and, and National Treasury are correct to say that you don't have to have uh, a residential address, that's not a requirement, et cetera, and that credit uh, for retailers is part, and take the section that they have said, uh, Esther, and put that there. So that's broadly the approach. Now, if anybody wants to add, because remember the, the team does the overview and all that, right? But then it's the members of parliament that must shape the recommendations and even observations. It was all contribute. So if parties that are not going to vote for this bill also have something to contribute, that's their right. Okay. Colleagues, comrades, that's their right. The multi-party democracy, they can put it there and still vote against the bill. Nothing wrong, but it's immensely irritating <laughs> when you accommodate them word for word as they still vote against the bill. I have no high expectations that they I don't have the two parties will vote for it, but you know what? They have a right to be here, they are elected. And you know, uh, well, through the nomination system on the NCOP. So, you know, if you have Molitsani or Dennis, anything you want to add, send it through. Ultimately, it's a majority that will agree or disagree with what you say. And sometimes the chair goes back to you, as you know, well, more in the last term than now, and say, why don't I just summarize it and make it shorter, but the content won't be changed. So, I'll also have a look at it if it comes to me. So is there anything anybody wants to add, even those of you who might vote against the vote? Nope. Okay. Well, then our meeting's drawing to a close. Thanks to the people who are here. And a note in the minutes, Kulek uh, was instructed by the chair that the chair entered the meeting at 18.03. 18.04 now, I see. A good 56 minutes ahead of time. And the committee unanimously congratulated him and said that they really value the expeditious processing of this meeting and that they are very glad to know that the two o'clock to five o'clock meeting on Thursday is likely, word for word, I want to say, right? <laughs> Not to last for three hours in brackets unless Dennis the Menace spoils the meeting with endless unnecessary questions. Close exclamation marks, two exclamation marks and close brackets. How about that? Anybody disagree with that uh, 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 observation that has to be minuted for uh, uh, posterity? Chair, uh, nobody's got their hand up. So if we, if we could just say that if the chair talked a bit less, we could have finished before <laughs> six. <laughs> Point of order. <laughs> okay, thanks guys. Okay, uh, we shall see you on Tuesday, hopefully briefly, especially if Willie doesn't insult the chairperson. Okay, thanks everybody. Bye then. Bye bye. Bye, chairperson.